mercy. mercy. The day dawns. The morning star is bright upon the horizon. The iron gate of our prison stands half open. One gallant rush from the north will fling it wide open, while four millions of our brothers and sisters shall march out into liberty. Frederick Douglass, 1863. Mercy. In the civil war between the north and the south, Frederick Douglass was not a soldier, not a politician. Yet he is a major figure in the coming of the Civil War and in the way the Civil War is fought. I think it's fair to say that in many ways he's the conscience of the nation in this instance because he keeps before it this idea that this is a war not just to bring the nation back together, but it's a war to end this awful system, slavery, and it's a war to bring equality to black people, to make them part of American society. I think he's sort of the image of a pillar of strength. If you had to pick someone, a tower of strength, just the strength emanates from him. And, and his hair, he's sometimes been characterized as the lion of Anacostia. People who described his speaking style and seeing and hearing him speak uh, talk about the kind of power. He had a, a deep, uh, baritone, rich toned voice. Frederick Douglass was certainly very striking as to his appearance. Um, an aquiline nose, very piercing, wide-set eyes, a very strong chin, and he was a tall man, about six feet, two inches, broad-shouldered, muscular, uh, a man who, in fact, uh, attempted to maintain himself in a strong and forceful appearance. Douglas's life sort of stands across the expanse of the 19th century as a symbol of the worst and the best in the American character. He was the slave who saw most of the worst brutalities of slavery. He was the slave, however, who freed himself and by luck, pluck, and gifts remade himself. Most importantly, he had an enormous ability to capture in words the meaning of what America is about. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. Frederick Douglass, 1845. It was along the eastern shore of Maryland, near a quiet creek called the Tuckahoe, that the life of the man who would inspire a nation began. Frederick Douglass was born in Talbot County on Maryland's eastern shore. He wasn't certain of his birth himself. In fact, he thought that he had been born in 1817. But slave records tell of the birth of Frederick Augustus to a slave named Harriet in February 1818. He knew who his mother was, although she was a distant figure in his life. Uh, she lived on another plantation. He never really knew who his father was, although he came to believe that his father was definitely a white man and probably his, his master. His master, Aaron Anthony, lived in the large white house that stood at the entrance to the plantation. It was part of a group of farms owned by a man known as Colonel Edward Lloyd. Edward Lloyd's plantation was quite large, especially by Maryland standards. Maryland was an upper south state where generally you didn't have large numbers of slaves like the massive plantations that you might have expected in some areas of the deep south. Raised by his grandmother at the far end of the plantation, the tiny boy named Frederick led a carefree, playful life along the muddy shores of the Tuckahoe, until he was six. At about age six, Douglas found that his childhood had come to an abrupt end. He was assigned to act as the companion and caretaker of the child of the owner of the plantation. And as a result, he could get in trouble 
for things that he either had done or had failed to do. And so it became immediately apparent that he was no longer a child but was a slave and was part of that institution of slavery. Slavery's basic premise was that black people were inferior and were here to do the heavy work so that the superior whites could spend their time doing more important things. Slavery was an institution where one human being had absolute control over another human being. They might be here tomorrow, they might be sold the next day. It was, in many ways, hopelessness condensed. They could not control where they went, what they did, what they ate, who they could marry, or even how they would conduct their religious lives. And so for many of these folks, it was truly just a step above the grave. Into the inhuman system of slavery, young Frederick quickly grew up at the Lloyd Plantation. Shortly after arriving there, he witnessed the brutal beating of an aunt of his, his Aunt Hester. Uh, she had actually been beaten by Aaron Anthony, his owner, because she had disobeyed him. And so she was strung up and brutally lashed by him. And Douglas was witness to that. Her arms were stretched up at their full length so that she stood upon the ends of her toes. He then said to her, now, you damned bitch, I'll learn you how to disobey my orders. And soon the warm red blood came dripping to the floor. Frederick Douglass, 1845. It must have been terribly dehumanizing. On the one hand, uh, Douglass and slaves like him were aware that there were free people of color and wondered, certainly, how that could be, why it was that there were some people who were free and some people who remained slaves like he and his uh, grandmother and his other relatives. And when you had free people in the midst of slaves in that way, it certainly did make the slaves long for freedom even more. I've often been utterly astonished to hear persons who speak of the singing of a slave as evidence of his contentment and happiness. This is a terrible mistake. The songs of a slave represent the sorrows of his heart. Frederick Douglass. Freedom. Young Frederick would discover his pathway to liberty after he was moved to the plantation owned by Hugh Ard, where he learned to read. The fact that Frederick Douglass learned how to read at all is amazing because in slavery, slaves were not supposed to learn how to read. It turned out that his mistress taught him how to read, despite the fact her own husband was not happy with the fact that she was doing that. She treated him as if he were an adopted child. And one of the things she did was, I think she was having trouble learning to read herself, but she was struggling to learn to read the Bible. And she taught him to read the Bible. He then, in his childhood, tricked his white childhood acquaintances into sharing their homework and their books with him, which was not something that would be accepted officially, but between kids, nobody ever thought much about it. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted, and I got it at a time when I least expected it. Frederick Douglass, 1845. At age 15, the slave Frederick Douglass was moved across the Chesapeake Bay to become a laborer. No longer isolated on a plantation, he would get a view of urban life in Baltimore. 
I've sat on Kenner's Wharf at the foot of Philpot Street in Baltimore, and I've seen men and women chained and put on a ship to go to New Orleans, and I still hear their cries. Frederick Douglass, 1845. In Baltimore, Douglas was hired onto a slave job in a shipyard, where he learned the skill and trade of the ship's cocker. When Frederick Douglass got a job in, in the shipyard in Baltimore, he was still a slave, but he was an urban slave. That is, he was rented out to someone who then paid him for his work. Allowed to keep a portion of his shipyard wages, Frederick eagerly saved to buy his first book. The first book that Frederick Douglass read was the Columbian Orator. And it's not really accurate to say he read it. He memorized it. He practiced it. These were a collection of famous speeches. And as he read them, he'd read them over and over again, and then he would practice them. He would practice the tone of voice. He would practice the way he was to de would deliver these, these speeches. In Baltimore, Douglas finds a community of free blacks. He finds religious institutions. He finds friends and perhaps even mentors in the black community and a sense of, of social identity. And this will serve him well in later life. It was at this time that Douglas would court a free black woman named Anna Murray. Anna Murray was a pious, very quiet, very supportive African-American woman. It is quite obvious why Douglas was attracted to her. She gave him the support that he was looking for. She encouraged him in his efforts to acquire his freedom. There were many plans that slaves used to secretly travel north to acquire their freedom. Henry Brown mailed himself to Philadelphia in a box. Still other slaves found freedom by becoming passengers on the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, uh, despite the sound of the word, is not really a railroad that runs underground. What it was was a series of places, houses, uh, barns, sheds, uh, tunnels, uh, uh, caves, just all sorts of places at strategic distances from slave territory into the north where runaway slaves were hidden by a variety of people, black people and, and white people. Harriet Tubman was the most famous and most wonderful of the operators on the Underground Railroad, a former slave who would have been very severely punished if she'd been caught. Harriet Tubman was truly working on the front lines. Harriet Tubman took a direct and personal involvement in the efforts of achieving African-American freedom. She literally went back into slave territory and, and personally led uh, slaves out on the Underground Railroad or through whatever means were possible in helping them to achieve their freedom. Frederick Douglass would someday meet and admire Harriet Tubman but not before he escaped on his own. In 1838, Douglas devises a plan with Anna Murray to escape to the north. She sells uh, a poster bed and gives him money to aid in the escape. He has papers that will allow him to pass for a sailor, and sailors traveled regularly, and there were, there were considerable numbers at that time of black sailors. So he's able to go by train to Wilmington, Delaware, still an area where he could be returned as a slave, and takes a steamboat for Philadelphia. In Pennsylvania, he is in a free state. He continued north to New York and was joined there by Anna Murray. They were married and resumed their journey north to New Bedford in Massachusetts. This whaling port held the bright promise of freedom for Douglas and his new bride. When Douglas arrives in New Bedford, Massachusetts, one of the first things if he attempts to do is find work. And he is, after all, a ship caulker. He had done that in, in Baltimore. New Bedford is a place where they build ships. But even in Massachusetts, he finds that racism 
will rear its ugly head. And there are white laborers who will not work alongside of a black ship's caulker. And so even though he is trained and skilled in this particular endeavor, he has to take a job as a common laborer, uh, cutting wood and doing other kinds of odd jobs in an attempt to, to make enough money to survive. But finding work wasn't all that Douglas thought about in Massachusetts. Douglas isn't safe in New Bedford for another important reason. He's still a slave. He's a runaway slave. He was a fugitive slave. And in the United States at that time, a fugitive slave, if found out, if captured, could be returned to slavery no matter how long he stayed in the place of his escape. Within months of his arrival in New Bedford, Douglas learned of the abolition movement. William Lloyd Garrison was perhaps the most prominent of the abolitionists of that period, and he was one of the group known as immediatist. These were abolitionists who wanted slavery to end immediately. On the subject of slavery, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of a ravisher but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. William Lloyd Garrison, 1831. Douglas becomes interested in abolitionism. He becomes interested in the newspaper published by William Lloyd Garrison called The Liberator, and becomes aware of the network of abolitionists that exist throughout the Northeastern states. The Liberator became my meat and my drink. My soul was set all on fire. Its sympathy for my brethren in bonds, its faithful exposures of slavery, and its powerful attacks upon the institution sent a thrill of joy through my soul such as I had never felt before. Frederick Douglass, 1845. A grand anti-slavery convention was held in Nantucket under the auspices of Mr. Garrison and his friends. I had taken no holiday since establishing myself in New Bedford, and I determined on attending the meeting. Frederick Douglass. The summer of 1841 saw Frederick Douglass steam away through the coastal waters of New Bedford. He called it his holiday, but as he crossed the water, he journeyed to a new beginning on the island of Nantucket. Douglas will attend a meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and Garrison speaks, Douglas is electrified. Garrison learns that an escaped slave is in the crowd and asks Douglas to stand up and say a few words. Men and women are in a semicircle on the podium and Douglas stands up at the lectern and begins his talk. And quietly, the voice begins. And he tells stories about having been a slave, what slave life was like. And for two hours, the audience will be just hanging on every word, just a huge crowd. And uh, he will work that crowd like a preacher. I stand before you this night as a thief and a robber. I stole this head, these limbs, this body from my master and ran off with them. I have seen this pious man cross and tie the hands of a young female slave and lash her on the bare skin and justify the deed with a quotation from the Bible. Frederick Douglass becomes an overnight success in this arena of public speaking in the anti-slavery cause, not at the beginning because of his oratorical powers, but because here is the genuine article. Here is a man who was himself a slave. The public have itching ears to hear a colored man speak, and particularly a slave. Multitudes will flock to hear one of his class speak, it would be good policy to employ a number of colored agents, if suitable ones can be found. 
John Collins, Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, 1842. Garrison, too, was impressed with Douglas and determined that Douglas could be of enormous help to the anti-slavery cause. And so fairly soon thereafter, Douglas is recruited to go about the country and lecture on behalf of the anti-slavery society. By 1843, Douglas had embarked with Garrison on the 100 Conventions Project, a six-month tour of anti-slavery meetings in New England, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana. As an abolitionist speaker, Douglas was regularly singled out for attack by pro-slavery supporters. Still, the great speaker would grow into a persuasive writer. Douglas publishes his first biography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, in 1845. In that autobiography, he does give details. He gives information about his owners. He talks about the, the area from which he had escaped. And he does so at great risk to himself. He knows that now the, the owner does know where he is and certainly could send a slave catcher to get him. In order to protect himself, in fact, he goes to England. And he stays in England for almost two years because he indeed believes, and others believe, that he will be taken back into slavery. While in England, friends of his collect money for his purchase, and they make arrangements with his owner to have him sold to them, of course, and Douglas gets his freedom that way. In 1847, Douglas returned to the United States, not as a fugitive slave, but as a free man. On his return from England, Frederick Douglass moves to Rochester, New York, and begins to publish a newspaper, The North Star. The symbolism, of course, of the North Star was the North Star was what the slave escaping to freedom followed. Uh, as he fled northward uh, toward what he hoped would be a better life. And Douglas wanted his newspaper to be part of that process toward a better life for all black people. It's also at this very time in the late 1840s and early 1850s that Douglas was really experiencing a kind of political awakening as well. He was beginning to learn uh, the art of politics, even though um, like all black leaders before the Civil War, he would never have elective sanction. In July of 1852, the people of Rochester invited Douglas to address their Independence Day festivities. For Douglas, this was not a date to celebrate. The character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July to drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems are inhuman mockery. My subject, fellow citizens, is American slavery. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. Frederick Douglass, 1852. The 1850s saw Frederick Douglass continue a comfortable home life in Rochester, New York. He and Anna would raise five children here, among them Charles and Rosetta. With their help, he would continue his newspaper, now called Frederick Douglass's paper. It was also in Rochester that he would meet John Brown. John Brown was an abolitionist who was absolutely dedicated to the overthrow of the institution of slavery. John Brown said that slavery could be purged only by blood. It could be overthrown only by force. And by the middle 1850s, Douglas was open to this message. John Brown and Douglas established a very close relationship because John Brown shared the mission that Douglas did 
John Brown was a white man who felt that it was immoral to hold slaves and was determined that he would do whatever was necessary to free them, and if necessary, lead the slaves in insurrection. John Brown had indeed planned such a revolt at a place called Harper's Ferry in Virginia. When Brown begins to develop his plan for the attack on Harper's Ferry, he wants Frederick Douglass to participate in it. Douglass thinks about it for some time, but he decides this is not for him. He decides not to do it. As a result of the raid, John Brown and his men were hung for treason. To Douglas, Brown had become a powerful symbol for the violent overthrow of the slave system. Posterity will owe everlasting thanks to John Brown. Slavery is a system of brute force. It must be met with its own weapons. John Brown has initiated a new mode of carrying on the crusade of freedom. Frederick Douglass, 1859. By 1860, the political dispute symbolized by men like John Brown had reached grand proportions, and the Republican Abraham Lincoln would run for president of a divided nation. Now, Abraham Lincoln, as the presidential candidate, has made some pretty non-committal kinds of remarks regarding slavery. But at the same time, the subtext is clearly to at least restrain slavery to the areas where it exists now, and perhaps if you squinted a little, you could see Lincoln looking down the road toward perhaps reducing the power of slavery. If he's elected president, the South is in dire difficulty. So as a result of Lincoln's election, uh, the South decides to take the fatal move to, to secede from the Union because they're sure that down the road, slavery is in dire peril. On April 12, 1861, Confederate troops bombarded Fort Sumter, a federal installation in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. When the first rebel cannon shattered the walls of Sumter, and drove away its starving garrison. I predicted that the war then and there would not be fought entirely by white men. The chance is now given you to end in a day the bondage of centuries and to rise in one bound from social degradation to the place of common equality with all other varieties of men. Frederick Douglass. Well, once the Civil War came, uh, to Frederick Douglass, it was unmistakable. Uh, this war had been caused by slavery, and, and its purpose ought to be the abolition of slavery. Uh, he saw Fort Sumter and the outbreak of war as, as more than reason uh, for the federal government to commit itself to a war against slavery. At least that's what he most fondly hoped. Douglass is glad to see the war come. He knows that it means the freedom of millions of slaves in the South and a changed way of life for thousands of free blacks in the North. Douglas argues, lectures, writes, proposes constantly that there should be a Negro army. These comments fall on deaf ears. The War Department has no interest in recruiting black soldiers. By refusing to let the blacks fight in the Union armies, the North was depriving itself of thousands of willing and able soldiers. And the casualties that the Northern armies faced on the battlefield would become alarming. September 17, 1862 saw the worst day of fighting as the U.S. Army at the Potomac and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia faced off along Antietam Creek in Sharksburg, Maryland. The Union lost 12,000 soldiers. In 1862, after the Battle of Antietam, it is clear that this is going to be a long and bloody and difficult war. Lincoln uses Antietam as an opportunity to announce his upcoming Emancipation Proclamation Whereas, on the 22nd day of September, A.D. 1862, 
All persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons. President Abraham Lincoln, 1862. One of the provisions in the Emancipation Proclamation was that African Americans could be enlisted to help win this war in any way that the administration thought they could be useful, including as soldiers. Douglas is, of course, wildly enthusiastic about this. And in 1863, Douglas is approached by George L. Stearns, a Massachusetts philanthropist and businessman who has been appointed to recruit a regiment of African-American soldiers for the Civil War, and Douglas becomes one of his recruiting officers. I hereby authorize Frederick Douglas to go to Washington, D.C. as my agent to transact business connected with the recruiting service for United States Colored Volunteers, Major George L. Stearns, August 1863. Douglas meets with Lincoln at the White House in August of 1863, uh, and they had a, an immensely respectful meeting. And frankly, Douglas came away from that, uh, as he once said in simple terms, I felt big there. Douglas came away with a certain respect for Lincoln's intentions, if not a total respect for his policies. In churches and meeting halls across the North, Douglas spoke to crowds of young black men convincing them to put on the uniform of the Union. From east to west, from north to south, the sky is written all over, now or never. I urge you to fly to arms and smite with death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. He who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Frederick Douglass, March 2nd, 1863. He goes out and heavily recruits uh, blacks for uh, particularly the 54th of Massachusetts, an all black unit with white officers. Two of Douglass's first recruits to the 54th Massachusetts were his sons, Charles Reman Douglas and Lewis Douglas, who would become Sergeant Major. One of the outstanding examples of black soldiers fighting in the Civil War was the 54th Massachusetts leading of the assault on Fort Wagner, one of the outposts defending Charleston Harbor in July of 1863. Robert Gould Shaw, who was the white Massachusetts colonel of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, had been pleading for an opportunity to prove that his men would fight, to prove their courage. And he got his wish when the commander assigned the 54th to lead the attack. They did so, they fought heroically, they suffered almost 50% casualties, including Colonel Shaw. This regiment has established its reputation as a fighting regiment. Not a man flinched, though it was a trying time. I have been in two fights and am unhurt. The last was desperate, and we charged that terrible battery on Morris Island, known as Fort Wagner. Men fell all around me. How I got out of that fight alive, I cannot tell. Sergeant Lewis Douglas, 1863. Douglas's role in the Civil War, in the victory in the Civil War, is important. The very fact that by the end of the war, some 200,000 black soldiers and sailors participated in the war. About a tenth of the entire Union force during this war is very, very important. One could argue that they were pivotal as the war was coming to an end. I end where I begin. No war but an abolition war. No peace but an abolition peace. Liberty for all. Chains for none. Frederick Douglass, 1864.
Standing in solitary grace in the hills above Washington, D.C., stands a stately home called Cedar Hill. It was here, far from the plantation where he was born in slavery, that Frederick Douglass would spend his final years. What's interesting about the house is that it's a large house, 14 rooms. It has a white columned porch, and it is an estate looking out over the Anacostia River at the Capitol. It is very reminiscent of the houses lived in by slave owners years before. And so Douglas has his sort of ironic uh, place in the sun in a setting that is very much representative of a Victorian gentleman. By the end of the war, Douglas is seen as a leader of black America. He is a fairly wealthy man. He is able to purchase a fine home, but he's still not satisfied. Douglas, to the end of his life, was looking for greater things. He wanted some governmental appointment, and eventually he did acquire those. He was made marshal of the District of Columbia. He spoke at anniversary after anniversary, at GAR reunion after GAR reunion, uh, down to the 1890s, where he tried to forge a kind of black abolitionist memory of the Civil War, increasingly losing that struggle against the sentimentalized, romanticized, lost cause conception of the meaning and memory of the Civil War. But to his dying day, Douglas insisted that what this war had been about was not just a fight between men of valor, but a struggle to establish, uh, as he once said, a nation that could live up to its creeds. In the winter of 1882, Douglas published his last autobiography. In the summer, he watched as Anna, his wife, died. He grieved terribly. He really seems almost to have had a nervous breakdown uh, in that following summer. Uh, but he pulled himself together, largely through being involved in reform things. And one of the uh, movements that he was very committed to was equal rights for women. Douglas never retired from public view in Washington. His lecture fee was now $150, plus expenses and he remained in constant demand. About 17 months or so after the death of his first wife, to whom he'd been married for 44 years, Douglas decides to again take up matrimony. He marries a woman that he has had uh, working in his office. Helen Pitts was nearly 20 years younger than Frederick Douglas and was white. When Douglas married her in 1884, this caused a tremendous sensation in the United States. One of the things that Douglas encountered in that new relationship was a realization that despite being the great Frederick Douglass, he was still another black man stepping across the bounds of American society's mores. If Douglas thought that he had overcome or that America had overcome its own prejudices, uh, his second marriage, as nothing else, brought that reality closer home to Douglas. It could be certain, however, that well into his 71st year, Douglas would not be stopped by bigotry. Late in his life, uh, President Benjamin Harrison, um, a Republican, uh, recognized uh, Douglas uh, in an interesting way and made him minister to Haiti, the Black Republic putting him out there as a representative of America, I think in many ways was, a, uh, in, a, in a sense, a crowning uh, part of his career. It was a career that in many ways was a miracle. Born a slave, he stood in his closing days a statesman. On February 20th, 1895, Frederick Douglass suffered a stroke at his home on Cedar Hill and was dead at the age of 78. What happens next is a solemn and somber 
awareness of Douglas's passing throughout the United States, African Americans throughout the country here as soon as the telegraph and the, and the railroads and other means can, can allow it to be known. If Frederick Douglass's great voice had been silenced, it had, before he died, been heard. Slavery is a doomed system. Um, slavery was over. But more than that, he had insisted always that African Americans must have full equality. He never wavered from that. To those who have suffered in slavery, I can say I too have suffered. To those who have battled for liberty, brotherhood, and citizenship, I can say I too have battled Frederick Douglass. On April 15, 1947, at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, Jackie Robinson makes his first appearance as a Major League Baseball player and shatters a half century of tradition. In the coming months and years, his courage and his character will be severely tested. Jackie Robinson is uniquely prepared to meet this challenge. Born in 1919 on a cotton plantation near the town of Cairo, Georgia, Jackie Robinson is six months old when his father deserts the family. Mally Robinson and her five children are forced to leave the one-room cabin on the plantation. The family sets out on a long journey in search of a new home. The trip ends in Pasadena, California, where Mally Robinson's brother has found a place for them to live. My mother had a strong sense of dignity and pride. She tried to teach all of us to stand up for what we believed. It wasn't easy at first. We were the only Negro family in the neighborhood. The only playmates I had were my brothers and sister. I went to school with my older sister, Willa May, when my mother worked. I was too young to go to classes, so I waited outside. I learned to get along on my own, to make up my own games, and I played them by my own rules. It seemed to me I always wanted something, and I couldn't have it. The best I could do for a baseball was a wad of rags, and I used to think if I ever could hold a real baseball, my life would be complete. I had to be a little bit better, or I couldn't get the play. I wanted to win, all kids do. But it meant a little bit more to me. Winning somehow took the sting out of being the outsider. My brother Mac was the star of the school's track team. When he was picked for the United States Olympic team in 1936, I was a proudest kid in the block. The 1936 Olympic Games are held in Nazi Germany. Boasts Adolf Hitler, the pure-blooded Nazi Aryan will prove his supremacy in this arena. The competition does produce a Superman, but he is neither Aryan nor Nazi. He is America's great Jesse Owens. 
Mac Robinson is proud to play second to Owens in the 200 meter dash. Mac set the example for me, says Jackie. And at Pasadena City College, he drives himself relentlessly in practice and competition. In 1938, he breaks Mac's record in the broad jump, establishing a new mark for himself. Jackie enrolls at UCLA in 1939. He has a vague idea that he wants to become a high school athletic coach, but his future plans are hazy, still uncertain. Football is the major sport at UCLA, and Jackie quickly becomes a mainstay of the team. He was a take-charge guy who hated to lose as a friend. And you could be sure that big number 28 would always be in the thick of the action. He is the leading ground gainer in collegiate football in his first season, averaging 12 yards per carry. And newspaper men called Jackie the gridiron phantom. Jackie sees each game as a personal battle in which he must prove he's better than any man on the field. Jackie stars in baseball, basketball, and he wins the national championship in the broad jump. In his senior year, he is called the best all-round athlete in America, the greatest Negro athlete of all time. Unquestionably, writes one reporter, he is the Jim Thorpe of his race. Jackie serves as an army officer during World War II and returns home in 1945 to face an uncertain future. I tried to get a job as a high school coach, but there were few openings I could fill. I was 26 years old. I had no job, only a mantle full of trophies. He is an extraordinary athlete, and he longs to play professional baseball. But by gentlemen's agreement, no Negro is given the opportunity to play in the major leagues. Baseball booms in the post-war era. Fans flock to the ballparks as familiar stars return from military service. Men like Stan Musial, Ted Williams, and Joe DiMaggio. Negroes have the chance to play baseball for pay only in a segregated league. Robinson is delighted when the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro American League offer him $400 a month to play ball. The pay is irregular, crowds are small, and playing conditions are poor. But Jackie Robinson is doing what he likes best. Campaigning for re-election in New York, Governor Tom Dewey begins a movement to wipe out racial restrictions in baseball. Most major league teams resist Dewey's suggestions. One man, however, Branch Rickey, secretly makes plans to break baseball's color line. The dynamic, outspoken general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers sees the Negro athlete as an untapped reservoir of talent. And as his Dodgers begin their training at Bear Mountain, he is already scouting Negro players. But Ricky knows that the first Negro to play Major League Baseball must be able to endure constant threats of physical violence, racial insults, even hostility from teammates. Ricky narrows his choice to a handful of men. He considers the brilliant but erratic Satchel Paige in his 40s and still pitching. The powerful, placid Roy Campanella. Don Newcomb, fiery young pitcher, and an infielder named Jackie Robinson. Ricky feels Robinson has intelligence, ability, courage, but he must be sure he is the right man. Robinson is summoned to his office for an interview. Branch Ricky tells about that first meeting. He was everything that I had hoped he would be at that moment. Uh, it, the, the surprise of that whole occasion was, was, uh, was Robinson. I couldn't convince him that I was giving him this interview and, and considering him for a job on the, on the hype team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. And there was finally an agreement that for three years, he would undertake to turn the other cheek and we defined what that meant in actual field play. 
Under Ricky's orders, Jackie will be forced to restrain his desire to fight back when he's insulted or threatened with physical violence. Robinson agrees and signs his contract with a mixture of exultation and apprehension. 1946. The Montreal Royals, a Brooklyn Dodger farm team, open the season at Jersey City. On their playing roster is baseball's most controversial new figure, Jackie Robinson. Spring training has been a harrowing experience for Robinson. During the barnstorming tour in the South, he has been reviled by fans and shunned by his own teammates. But in a season ahead, he will channel his anger and humiliation into a driving determination that will become the trademark of Jackie Robinson. In 1947, the Brooklyn Dodgers and Montreal Royals begin spring training in Panama. Largely because of Robinson, Branch Rickey has been forced to move his teams out of the traditional training grounds in the South. Robinson knows there is resistance against him. Dodger players have signed a petition protesting his appearance on the field. The challenge of acceptance by his teammates, that was the first hurdle that had to be made. And there was the petition on the club. We've never advertised that. Uh, Dixie Walker, an eminent gentleman, and Stanky, a mobile boy, and they were opposed to it. A tremendous opposition to it at the time. Uh, I didn't decide to, um, to put him on the Brooklyn Club until a Saturday before the opening on Tuesday of the National League season. That first day, I tried to tell myself it was just another game. I tried to blot out the sounds and the excitement, but I couldn't do it. There was so much riding on this game, not only for me, but for Mr. Ricky. I could see Mr. Ricky catching every ball with me. He kept urging me to be more aggressive. He was such an inspiration to me, I know I couldn't have made it without him. Jackie Robinson proves he can hold his own on the playing field, but he is still the outcast, forced to live in separate hotels. He has no roommates and is known as the loneliest man in baseball. Forced to turn the other cheek, he must let his baseball ability speak for him. Slowly, the fans from Flatbush begin to accept Jackie Robinson, and so do his teammates. Says Branch Rickey, the players rallied to his defense, and it caused the glue on the club that molded them into a pennant-winning team. For the Brooklyn Dodgers, it's the first pennant in six years. Brooklyn fans shower their affection on the beloved bum. Jackie Robinson crowns his first season in the major leagues by being named Rookie of the Year. Branch Rickey couldn't ask for anything more. The season has been exhausting. Though he is the first Negro to play in Major League Baseball, Robinson has earned just $5,000. To supplement his income, he sells home appliances. As a national sports figure, Jackie has taken it upon himself to shoulder a further responsibility. The Brotherhood movement is gaining ground every day. It is slowly and surely becoming a fact and not remaining just a theory. And I'm glad that I can report from my own personal experiences on the baseball diamond that the feeling of intolerance no longer exists. By 1949, Robinson has paved the way for others to follow. Men like catcher Roy Campanella and pitcher Don Newcomb. The Negro's position in baseball is secure. Branch Rickey removes all restrictions, and 1949 is Robinson's year. They 
better be rough on me, Jackie declares, because I'm going to be rough on them. Almost overnight, Jackie becomes the holler guy, the spark plug behind Brooklyn Victory. July 1949, Jackie Robinson is unexpectedly cast into the political spotlight. With his wife, Ray, by his side, a mature and confident Jackie Robinson testifies before the House Un-American Activities Committee. I've been asked to express my views on Paul Robeson's statement in Paris to the effect that American Negroes would refuse to fight in any war against Russia because we love Russia so much. I haven't any comment to make except that any event of war with Russia, Negroes and Italians and Irish and Jews and Swedes and Slavs and other Americans would act just as all these groups did in the last war. They'd do their best to keep their country out of war. If unsuccessful, they'd do their best to help their country win the war against Russia or any other enemy that threatened us. The 1950s. In his new home in suburban Stamford, Connecticut, Jackie savors the rewards of years of struggle. He is an established major league star, earning a major league salary in five figures. In the off season, he can relax with his family, enjoying economic security he never knew in childhood. And for his son, there will be no need to play baseball with broom handles and rags. Jackie is imbued with a nagging sense of responsibility. He feels he must speak out where injustice has been done. His friend and teammate, Roy Campanella, often disagrees with Jackie. I'm no crusader, says Campanella. I'm just a baseball player. Robinson will not tolerate this attitude. He has always been a fighter. He will continue to be a fighter. A man must speak out for what he believes, says Jackie. Robinson is now more than a ball player. He is, by circumstance, a representative of his race. We were put through the usual bag of tricks right in this state. At first, we were told that the house we were interested in had been sold just before we inquired. Or we would be invited to make an offer, a sort of a seal bid, and then we'd be told that the offer higher than ours had been turned down. Then we tried buying houses on the spot for whatever price was asked. They handled, they handled this by telling us the house had been taking off, taken off the market. And once we met a broker who told us he would, he would like to help us find a home, but his clients were against selling to Negroes. And whether or not we got a story with the refusal, the re results were always the same. He is praised for his explosive play in the field, but is sometimes criticized for deliberately engaging in controversy. Jackie's a guy who likes to mouth off, many say. He's a troublemaker. And Jackie himself admits, my temper cost me my popularity. 1955, Jackie Robinson is 36. He is the elder statesman of the Dodgers. He occupies a center locker, a special mark of distinction. Nine hectic years in the majors have been filled with controversy. In the twilight of his baseball career, reporters call him the old gray fat man. His legs lack speed, agility. His reflexes are sluggish. Dodgers, however, clinch the National League pennant late in September. Once more, they will face the Yankees in the World Series. For Jackie Robinson, there may not be another. Since 1947, the Dodgers have won the pennant four times. And four times they have lost to the New York Yankees in the World Series. The experts predict the Dodgers will be beaten for the fifth consecutive time. 
The Dodgers are an old team, they say, virtually unchanged since 1947. Even the most loyal Dodger rooters are skeptical. But in this World Series, the 36-year-old Jackie Robinson flashes the daring speed that recalls the Robbie of old. Robinson, the Dodgers win the 1955 World Series. Writes one reporter, the old gray fat man had done what he wanted. He had shown the Dodgers, he had shown the Yankees, he had shown the world. I had decided that I'd used up the good years. I didn't want to work out the string as a pinch hitter or a part-time player. Most of all, I wanted security for my family. I had considered the possibility of becoming a manager, but when the president of Chock Full of Nuts, Mr. William Black, offered me a job as vice president in charge of personnel, I was so impressed by the man and the company that I decided to start my new career here. What appealed to me most was that I wasn't being hired in order to have my name adorn a letterhead but I was being asked to join the company and become an integral part of the organization. The job was and still is a challenge, but that's the way I like it. Generally, I meet with Mr. Black to go over new employee programs, brief him on my activities, and discuss new company policies, or to get an occasional balling out. I rarely miss baseball. I just don't have the time to miss it. But if I did, it would be the playing. I never felt comfortable as a spectator. Looking back now on my days in baseball, I can remember times when I was advised not to press issues or speak out when I felt it was necessary. But I couldn't do that. I believe that a man is judged on more than the power of his hands and legs. He's judged also on the strength of his mind and his character. Not to speak out when I saw or felt an injustice would have been as bad as taking the third strike every time I came to bat. Right now, if I had the chance to live my life over again, I'd live it the same way. In July of 1962 at Cooperstown, New York, Jackie Robinson receives baseball's highest honor. He is elected to the Hall of Fame. He sees it as the crowning achievement of his career. Says Jackie Robinson, this is the proudest day of my entire life. Sir Good, who or coming from where? Sir Good is coming. He was one of those people when he walked into a room, you knew he was there. Even if you had your back to him and didn't see who it was, you could feel the energy. There is very little truth in the old refrain that one cannot legislate equality. Laws not only provide concrete benefits, they can even change the hearts of men. He woke America up and he made us really think about some of the injustices that we had just been overlooking. He was a voice for equal rights and equal justice, and uh, he always played that role to the end of his life. 
I'm an advocate and I represent the United States government and I'll do it in the best I can. He's your all-American boy, your all-American hero in some ways uh, because of his absolute faith in the Constitution and in American judges and in the law. On October 1, 1967, Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American Supreme Court Justice in the history of the United States. The appointment was a natural climax to a law career based on interpreting the Constitution. He believed fervently in the Constitution. He felt that that was the tool that would eventually make black people equal to whites in this country. What I say is that I have faith in the efficiency of the law. Perhaps that is because I'm a lawyer and not a missionary. But I think history, which proves so many things, proves me right. Thank you very much. The Supreme Court nomination was the culmination of a life lived in the pursuit of equality. Before Martin Luther King, before Malcolm X or Jesse Jackson, Thurgood Marshall was blazing a trail as a civil rights crusader. It is a side of Marshall that is little known today. Marshall is known to this generation as a rather reserved, uh, aloof man who was on the Supreme Court, not as the revolutionary figure who was out and about and uh, quite an attractive, striking figure who was voted in the late 50s as Mr. Civil Rights in a poll of black Americans. That kind of energy and dynamism is absent in the portrait of Marshall that exists today in the late 1990s. Marshall was the product of an established black community in Baltimore. Baltimore had a history as a place that offered slaves the opportunity to earn money and buy their freedom. Marshall's grandfather owned one of the largest grocery stores in Baltimore. You have in Baltimore a strong black middle class that from the first is insisting on its rights as opposed to whites, saying we have a right to education, we have a right to uh, sit on juries, we have a right to uh, have black teachers in the public schools, we have right to public schools. All these issues surface in Baltimore uh, by the end of the century, the end of the 1800s. It was into this heritage that two days before Independence Day in 1908, Thurgood Marshall was born the first son of William and Norma Marshall. His mother was a school teacher. His father was employed by the railroad, which it, at that time was a, a high-level job for a black man. William Marshall worked as a waiter, first on the segregated Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, later at a whites-only country club. He had an interest in the law and often brought Thurgood along to Baltimore's courthouses to watch trials. He also discussed the Constitution with his son, especially the 14th Amendment, which guarantees the rights of all citizens. Marshall credits his father with subtly steering him towards a career in law. His mother, Norma, was an elementary school teacher with a graduate degree from Columbia University in New York. She had great plans for Thurgood and his younger brother. He was the child of an extraordinarily ambitious mother, a mother who produces a doctor and a lawyer in terms of a black family in the early part of this century. That's an amazing accomplishment that a woman's two sons would become a doctor and a lawyer. But that's exactly what Norma Marshall accomplishes. And she does this by impressing on the boys a strong sense of ambition. Early on, we would just hear about uh, our grandmother, who was a school teacher. And uh, I think that's where we, we would hear about the education a lot. Uh, you know, if you, your grandmother was here, she'd be making sure you were doing this and that, and those kind of stories. But Marshall had a mind of his own. His mother often found him hanging out with the tough kids in the neighborhood. Thurgood is the one with the comic book stuck in his back pocket, chewing gum, smoking cigarettes, and messing around. Though Marshall did well in school, he was often in trouble. The punishment he received was tailor-made for a future civil rights lawyer. One of the things that the principal would do 
to punish him was to send him down in the basement with a copy of the Constitution and force him to memorize the Constitution. Marshall's life was not free of incidents of racial discrimination. Though Baltimore was a liberal city compared to its southern neighbors, segregation was the law of the land. The United States was still a country where lynchings were not uncommon, and the Ku Klux Klan could march in the nation's capital to cheering crowds. But he did not let racial discrimination deter him. Marshall's parents had taught him to be proud of his race, and his community encouraged him to do great things. This was a collection of individuals that, that he learned a lot from about commitment to work and um, work within the community. I think that if you had met Thurgood Marshall coming out of high school, you would have said, this is the most middle class, uh, comfortable child I've ever met and the least likely person to challenge the system. In 1925, Marshall became a student at Lincoln University. Lincoln in Oxford, Pennsylvania, was then considered the Black Princeton. He was a B student with a reputation as a partier and prankster. To help pay for his tuition, Marshall worked during the summer as a railroad porter. Even then, he was a, a tall, lanky uh, young man. And uh, when the uh, head uh, um, <clears throat> conductor said, OK, you could have the job, uh, go around to this window and, and get your uniform, he came back. And uh, he said, uh, but sir, the, the, the pants they have uh, are only uh, size uh, 16 and uh, I need at least a 20 these are going to come up to my to my shins and the conductor looked at him and said boy you know it's cheaper for me to get another Negro than to get another pair of pants do you want the job or not it was while at Lincoln that Marshall's activism was awakened in one incident he and a group of friends desegregated one of the movie theaters in town by sitting in the section reserved for whites though Marshall didn't realize it he had begun his career as a civil rights crusader. And when Marshall met Vivian Buster Bury, his personal life took a turn as well. Vivian was, he said, a cute chick. The two fell in love and were married on September 4th, 1929, as Thurgood was entering his last year at Lincoln. Marshall graduated from Lincoln with honors and the goal of becoming a lawyer. I think the normal and natural course in a world free of racism and segregation would have been to go to the University of Maryland Law School. That's where he wanted to go. But he never applied, and I think the thought in his mind was, they don't accept blacks. So what he had to do was to apply to Howard University Law School and travel the 40 miles back and forth from Baltimore to Washington because he couldn't afford to live here. At Howard, he received more than a law degree. Under the tutelage of his mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston, he found a path for his career. It's Charles Hamilton Houston, the dean of the law school, who quickly identifies him as the star student at Howard Law School and begins to push him and help him, and helps him to get a job in the uh, law school library, helps him to get involved with cases outside of the law school that give Marshall an extraordinary experience in terms of what it means to do civil rights law in this period, gives him an understanding of the really broader social aspects of the law, tells him quite explicitly that if a lawyer is not a social uh, architect, he's a social parasite. In 1933, Marshall graduated from Howard, first in his class. He then went home to Baltimore to begin his career as a lawyer he would quickly realize that law was not just his career, but his mission. After law school, Marshall returned to his hometown of Baltimore and opened his own practice. In his first year, Marshall gained the reputation as a skilled attorney and little man's lawyer. He also ended up $1,000 in debt. So what he finds though, is that the NAACP in Baltimore are anxious to have him begin to deal with some of the racial issues 
that have been sitting around town for a long time. Everything from teacher pay to uh, situations where blacks are unfairly accused and cr of crimes. As the local lawyer for the NAACP, Marshall argued for his community in the same courts he had visited as a child. And what he was doing in these courts was revolutionary, gaining equality through the law. So what was radical was Marshall using the law to try to achieve this, because previously people had tried direct appeal or political pressures and had not been successful. His eventual goal was to have the Supreme Court eliminate separate but equal facilities for blacks. Separate but equal was the law of the land from 1896 under Plessy v. Ferguson, and basically said that uh, as long as facilities were equal, separation of the races was legal and constitutional. Marshall, I think, understood and from his training under Charlie Houston quite quickly that this was a fiction, that there was separate, but there was no equal. Marshall considered equal education for blacks a key to their equality. He hoped to lay the groundwork for the eventual desegregation of all schools by attacking separate but equal, first at the graduate school level. Now that's striking the, the court where it lives, right? These are people who've been to law school. They understand uh, the value of a law school education. And the other advantage, of course, that he has is that in the civil rights area, as he's going along in this early phase, in many cases, he's making the law so that he can go to someone and say, but you're not aware this is the law, Your Honor. You've got to read and understand this, and here's the site, and here's the precedent. In keeping with this plan, Marshall took on the case of Donald Murray, a student who had been denied admission to the University of Maryland Law School because of his race. The case struck a personal chord with Marshall. In June of 1935, 27-year-old Thurgood Marshall presented the case before the Maryland Supreme Court and won. The entire neighborhood knew about it, and the Afro-American wrote headlines about it. It was a very uh, significant victory and a very happy uh, victory for all of us. After the Murray case, the NAACP in New York offered Marshall the job of Assistant General Counsel. In 1935, he and Buster moved to Harlem. Harlem in the 1930s was quite different from the small town Baltimore that the couple knew. Marshall and Buster enjoyed their new city's lively nightlife, visiting jazz clubs, and socializing with Marshall's friend from college, singer Cab Calloway. Marshall was now 30 years old and quite an impressive young man. He was physically handsome, a skilled attorney, and a charismatic speaker. He was one of those people, when he walked into a room, you knew he was there, even if you, even if you had your back to him and didn't see who it was, you could feel the energy. You got to imagine here a tall, sort of caramel-colored man with wavy hair, wonderful little bushy mustache, in addition to which he had a sort of elegant swagger to him. He was uh, very outgoing and uh, he was also a homespun type of person who made you welcome and he reached out and was embracing of people and their concerned about their problems. As assistant and later chief counsel for the NAACP, Marshall worked on problems ranging from voting rights to equal pay to school admissions. Slowly but surely, he was preparing for the eventual elimination of the separate but equal ruling. He carefully engineered those cases from the very beginning. He selected the plaintiffs in various states. He moved the cases along through the lower courts. He raised the basic issues at the first opportunity and preserved them through the appellate process. In 1939, the NAACP created the Legal Defense Fund to handle the growing number of civil rights cases. Marshall was chosen as its director. He held the post for 21 years. At the beginning, of course, he did it all himself. There was no staff, so he was a one-man band. I mean, he did the planning, he did the, the filing of the papers. Uh, uh, in the very early days, I, I didn't see this, but I heard he would sit in an automobile with a port portable typewriter and type his papers. Much of his work involved traveling through the South, 
convincing people to become plaintiffs in civil rights cases. Marshall was the first to bring the news that the law could work for rather than against the black community. Still, it was quite risky in the 1940s for blacks to bring lawsuits. At that period of time, they were risking jobs. They were risking their, their uh, themselves physically. Uh, they were risking, risking a great deal from the white community. For many people, it was unimaginable that segregation would come to an end or could come to an end as a result of litigation. So you had to tell them, you know, that's what the law is, that's what it ought to be, and that's what we can get for you. It was Marshall, telling stories and sharing drinks, who convinced people that the law would work for them. And it was Marshall who made it work. His victories in court earned Marshall the title Mr. Civil Rights. And the word would come that Thurgood was coming. Then no one had to say Thurgood who or coming from where. Thurgood is coming. And that would have the impact of just lifting the spirits of the people. And, and they would say, we can make a difference. We're not going to run away. We're not going to hide. But we're going to stand together and fight. Not everyone was happy about the changes Marshall was pursuing. And as his reputation as a civil rights crusader grew, his travels became more dangerous. He would stay in, in people's homes, uh, and he and the, perhaps he was traveling with another lawyer, they'd sleep with their clothes on because they never knew when a lynch mob might be coming down the street in the middle of the night, and they always had an escape plan. Time and time again, he feels quite threatened. He goes into Dallas, and the sheriff says, you know, I'm gonna, I can't wait to see that black son of a bitch because I'm going to kick his ass. And he has to, you know, go to the governor and ask the governor for some protection to make sure everything's OK. And the governor gives him a state trooper to make sure that this other person doesn't attack him. That kind of thing goes on pretty constantly. Despite the danger, Marshall continued working to break down the laws of segregation. However, he followed those laws when he was in the South. His arena of activism was the courts. He didn't go out and picket. Uh, he didn't insist upon sitting at a white lunch counter or in a white restaurant. He followed the segregation rules down there and he did his job. He, he was not an activist or a protester, he was a lawyer. He recognized that using the law to affect change in the United States and to affect civil liberties and civil rights uh, was the key to success. He was working within the system. As the chief counsel for the NAACP, Marshall was fighting a white establishment for the rights of blacks. But he never became a racist himself. Marshall understood that there were there was good and bad in every race, and he didn't try to categorize people just simply because of the color of their skin, because he didn't want people to think of him and other African Americans that way. He just doesn't have any kind of uh, sense of whites as being awful. But at the same time, I think that he understood and felt, especially when he was in the courtroom and dealing in these situations, that there were people who were white, who were threatening and dangerous, and, uh, and were willing to use segregation and racism to oppress people. But he, I think, was able to separate the two. I don't think he ever became a hateful person. By 1950, Marshall had been directing the Legal Defense Fund for 10 years. No longer a one-man band, he now directed a staff of lawyers. He gave all of us credit when he was in public. He said, you know, I didn't do all this, they did it. When he was working, uh, there were, you didn't joke, you didn't uh, waste time, you had an assignment he gave you and he expected it to be completed. It was uh, inviolate that you did that work and you produced and you performed. But at the end of a hard day of work, Marshall was always ready for a good meal, a good drink, and a good story. And had a tremendous sense of humor. He could tell some pretty off-colored jokes, which uh, would be, if they were told by someone else, embarrassing, but you would find yourself responding to them uh, because of the way in which he told them. His basic way of looking at life was to have as much fun as you can, tell stories. He was a great party man, and he might say, well, now it's time to go to dinner. I'm going to take you all to dinner. Let's go. 
and we'd go to dinner. And if we had to work that night, we'd come back and work that night. By the early 50s, Marshall had been working to end discrimination for two decades. Soon, he would argue the case for which he had been laying the groundwork for those 20 years. Marshall was now seeing some results from his work. In many states, blacks were attending universities and voting. Sports teams were being integrated and President Truman had ordered the desegregation of the military. However, separate but equal was still the law of the land. As the NAACP's chief attorney, Marshall was sometimes accused of being too cautious in his pursuit of civil rights through the courts. He sometimes was criticized on cases for not being daring enough and uh, uh, far reaching enough in his uh, efforts. But of course, he had to bear in mind that if the case was lost, uh, then a whole big campaign would collapse. And he is reluctant, and I think everybody else is reluctant, to go from arguments related to separate but equal to make the leap to say, we're not even arguing about that anymore. We're just saying it's wrong to segregate people under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. It's just wrong. But in the early 1950s, Marshall judged the courts ready to take on the challenge of school segregation. The case he chose, Brown versus the Board of Education, was really five civil rights cases grouped together to go before the Supreme Court. Marshall was basing his case on the argument that separating black and white students was harmful to the black children. This was an untested approach, and he organized teams of specialists to help with the research. He was like an orchestra conductor. Uh, he would bring in some of the best minds in the country, uh, law professors, historians, social scientists, and out of all of that, he would then sort of tease out what would be the approach, and then he would decide to go ahead with it, and he did it. Those involved with the preparations of Brown versus the Board of Education realized that this was a historic case. It was fascinating to be in the middle of the these, the dynamics, uh, it was electrifying to be in the NAACP at that point, and you could really feel the currents of uh, excitement and the hope and the, the uh, growing joy, uh, believing that uh, this, we were coming to a climax. Opening statements on Brown versus the Board of Education began on December 7, 1952. Arguing against Marshall was distinguished advocate John W. Davis, a staunch segregationist. Though he had admired the more formal Davis since law school, Marshall brought a more colorful style to the courtroom. When John W. Davis had made the point that putting all these children together because of their varying abilities would, uh, would bring shockwaves, he said, um, there's no problem with that. Just put the dumb colored kids with the dumb white kids and put the smart colored kids with the smart white kids. It's the kind of thing that a white person really would not say. And that uh, uh, Mr. Marshall at the time could and did say. It was exactly the kinds of sort of very practical suggestion that he would feel free to make. When both lawyers were called back for re-arguments in 1954, Davis was sure he had won. In reality, the court was split five to four in favor of Marshall. But the justices, knowing how controversial the issue was, wanted at least a strong majority. And Chief Justice Earl Warren lobbied for nothing less than a unanimous decision. No one knew how the country was going to react, no one. Uh, and as I say, they, they, they didn't know whether there would be blood in the streets or whether uh, the country would quietly, quietly accept it. They didn't know whether the country would quietly ignore it. Um, so there was a strange feeling in connection with that case that I never saw with any other case. And that is, uh, no matter what we decide, what's going to happen? On May 17, 1954, Justice Warren read the judge's opinion before a packed courtroom. Not until he was halfway through did the crowd realize that the court had voted unanimously in favor of Marshall. Everybody was surprised. 
uh, that it was unanimous. In fact, when the opinion was announced, there was a big ah in the courtroom, a big intake of breath, because no one had, had expected that. The Brown case made 47-year-old Thurgood Marshall a national figure. He was the man who was bringing integration to the United States. And yet, at this moment of triumph, Marshall suffered a personal tragedy. He learned that his wife, Buster, was dying of cancer. Marshall dropped his work to care for her in their Harlem apartment until she died on February 11, 1955. The couple had no children. Marshall had little time to grieve Buster's death because of the massive resistance to the Brown ruling, especially in the South. Though the Supreme Court had outlawed segregated schools, they had not provided a firm deadline by which schools had to be integrated. And there were certainly communities which planned to delay integration for as long as possible. Marshall was soon back in court, fighting to have the new decision enforced at the local level. His persuasiveness, however, was not limited to the courtroom. He's a man who is able to wrap his arms around a Southern sheriff at just the right time and take on that deep Southern drawl and say, you know, this ain't right now. How can we work this out, son? And for some reason, this old Southern white guy will say, you know, that Faubus is a jerk and work with Marshall. But Marshall couldn't charm the entire South and violence against blacks increased, culminating in the now infamous incident in Little Rock, Arkansas. A mob of angry whites, inflamed by the rhetoric of Governor Orville Faubus, prevented nine black students from entering Central High School. Thurgood Marshall went to Little Rock to try to reason with the school board and to comfort the students and their families. They were very much buoyed by the strength of Marshall, by his physical presence, by his explanation to them of what was going to happen and why they should remain strong. But the situation in Little Rock only got worse until finally President Dwight Eisenhower was forced to intervene. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. In September of 1958, in an unprecedented move, the Supreme Court justices wrote an opinion reaffirming their original unanimous decision in Brown. Any action on the part of any official in Arkansas or any private individual to oppose desegregation of the schools of Little Rock is deliberately calculated violation of the law. After the Brown decision, the black community realized that equality was indeed possible, and a new energized civil rights movement took to the streets. Martin Luther King now became the most visible crusader for equal rights. His methods differed from those of Marshall, who continued to believe that the courts held the key to equality. From Marshall's point of view, if we don't have a court case, if we don't have the law changed, we really have, don't have permanent change. I think from Marshall's perspective, he's doing the real work, the real brick laying that's going to amount to something, a structure that's going to stand in history, while he saw King as giving uh, nice speeches. Throughout the 50s, Marshall continued his pursuit of equal rights through the courts. He appeared before the Supreme Court 32 times and won 29 of those cases. With Marshall, you really got the impression that what he was saying had to be right, that, that there no honest person could really avoid the thrust of what he was arguing, that he really, really believed in this cause. And that made him very effective. In 1961, Marshall was offered the chance to experience the court from the other side of the bench. President Kennedy nominated him for a judgeship on the U.S. Court of Appeals. Marshall was now on a new path, one that would change not only his life, but the history of the Supreme Court. In the early 1960s, the civil rights movement was experiencing great changes. 
as the fight for equality moved out of the courtroom and into the streets. Thurgood Marshall's life was in transition as well. He had traded his lawyer's briefs for a judge's gavel. And after his first wife, Buster, died of cancer in the mid-50s, Marshall married Cecilia Suyat. The two met at the NAACP, where Sissy was working as a secretary. It was said of Marshall that he was a man who needed to be married. This was an individual who didn't much care that his shoes maybe a few years past their, their life expectancy. A person who kept much to himself in terms of personal feelings. I got the distinct sense that my parents shared a lot with each other that they did not share with anyone else. The couple had two sons, Thurgood Jr. and John. Despite his hectic schedule, Marshall always made time for his family. He would do spend time with us whenever he could, and that's what I remember most, that he would take the time out for us. He was a wonderful dad to have. He's just a, a great big, happy fella, and, and generally my favorite place was to just sort of sit on his lap, whether we had uh, the radio or the television on or visitors. Marshall was 57 when President Lyndon Johnson nominated him as Solicitor General in July of 1965. As the Solicitor General, Marshall would argue the government's cases before the Supreme Court. The talent that uh, Thurgood Marshall has, with the understanding that he has of the law and with the compassion that, and understanding that he has of people, that uh, he'll make uh, one of the great uh, Solicitor Generals of uh, the history of this country. So I'm very proud to introduce him to this committee. Not only did Johnson respect the work Marshall had done throughout his life, the president also appreciated his boisterous personality. I think it's a meeting of minds and personalities and agendas. These two get along really well. They both understand the ways of uh, Southern bourbon and love of great stories. You know, Marshall's just a great pal for him. There was the feeling on Johnson's part that he was a man of great intelligence, who was tremendously hardworking, who had the right set of values, who had been on the right track for a long time, and Johnson had genuine regard for that kind of personal record. Well, one concluding question. Is there anything you can think of in your mind or in your disposition to prevent you from acting fairly, effectively, and efficiently for the United States government in this position? Not at all, sir. I believe that, oh, I'm certain that there's no possible reason that I could have to not adequately represent this government, which is, after all, my government, just as it is all of our government. Well, thank you, Judge Marshall. Thank Any you, other sir. questions from the committee? The meeting will be adjourned. Marshall's long career as a lawyer made him a natural choice for the post of Solicitor General, and he was sworn in on August 11, 1965. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I think Marshall was also a very thoughtful and wise politician. He understood that he wasn't simply Solicitor General. He was an emblematic figure. He was a symbol of major changes taking place in American life. For many in the black community, those changes were too slow in coming. By the mid-60s, this impatience was turning to rage, a rage that resulted in violent demonstrations and race riots. It was in this climate that LBJ nominated Thurgood Marshall as the first African-American appointee to the Supreme Court in July of 1967. This landmark nomination would have been unimaginable only a decade before when Marshall was arguing the Brown case. I believe it's the right thing to do, the right time to do it, the right man in the right place. Johnson was concerned to say to the country, do not have an image of black Americans as simply lawless. Johnson was sending a message to the country that here is a black jurist, a man who believes in the rule of law, whose life has been defined by the rule of law, and I'm appointing him to the Supreme Court. And Marshall did indeed still hold fast to his belief in the American legal system. In a speech he gave in 1966, he reaffirmed his faith in the law as the route to equality. 
There is very little truth in the old refrain that one cannot legislate equality. Laws not only provide concrete benefits, they can even change the hearts of men, some men anyhow, for good or evil. Not all men had changed, however. A group of Southern senators strongly opposed Marshall's appointment to the Supreme Court, both because he was black and because he would add another liberal vote to an already liberal court. In the end, Marshall's qualifications for the job couldn't be denied, and he was finally confirmed in a 69 to 11 vote. It was an electrifying appointment because it symbolized so much, and, uh, and also because the man was uh, substantively uh, so uh, beyond question. On October 1st, 1967, Thurgood Marshall arrived at the Supreme Court to begin his tenure as America's first black Supreme Court justice. It wasn't only Marshall's color that made him unique among the other justices, it was also his history as a civil rights crusader, a lawyer for the people. The credential he brought to the court, I think that was, that was so critical, was that he had not been in the great halls of academe, he had not been in the great powerful Wall Street law firms. His experience had been with people and people's lives. Though Marshall's life had been dedicated to gaining equal rights for blacks, his scope on the court was much broader. His was a voice for the constitutional rights of all citizens. He believed in common law, that it should apply to all of us, and that it wasn't his personally nor uh, a privileged group, that it should be impartially applied and it should be available to us as people. By the 70s, Marshall had become a liberal on a conservative court. And though his views were increasingly unpopular, Marshall had no intention of retiring, no matter who was waiting. One of the times when he was sick uh, in Bethesda Naval Hospital, I believe it was the Nixon administration, they had requested a, an update, you know, on his, on his condition. I said, well, I give you my permission to release it to him, providing you had a final sentence to it, which is, quote, not yet. And uh, he did <laughs> put it on there. Though Marshall was discouraged by the court's conservative turn, he did not give up. He wrote eloquent dissents in the hope that they would someday be used to overturn the conservative rulings. He thought that, in fact, he was doing heroic work, that he, he had a job to do to, to set out this alternate view of the world, uh, to be contrary in some cases, that right down to the end to say, you know, this is a court that's not following the rule of law, but it's following the latest election results and is acting in a kind of uh, contrary and ill-mannered way. Marshall would remain on the court for another decade, years marked by debilitating health and a growing disillusionment with the court. By the 1980s, Marshall was one of the only liberal voices left on the Supreme Court. He often expressed dismay at the rulings of his colleagues. If you really believe in certain causes, as certainly he did, uh, you don't take lightly the fact that the law is shifting and that uh, old truths are no longer the winning ones. As Marshall got older, the years of constant pressure took their toll on him, and he was forced to slow down. He just became physically debilitated. I mean, his vision uh, was going he was having problems with his heart. He had a hard time walking. He used a cane. Uh, sometimes uh, the driver of the car would have to help him. Uh, but he had the same sense of humor and the same uh, sense of irony. He uh, certainly loved to eat and drink as much as he ever did. Though his health was failing, Marshall was determined to stay on the bench and add his voice of compassion for as long as possible. Hopefully, he thought, until a Democratic president was elected. I have a deal with my wife that when I be begin to show any signs of senility, she'll tell me, and she will. He had a, a standard quote that he would use for people, which is, he'd say he was going to be, he was going to serve out the term that he had been given by President Johnson, which was a lifetime term. 
and that uh, the only time he was going to leave the court was when he was shot by a jealous husband. It was Marshall's health, not a jealous husband, that ended his days on the court. In June of 1991, at the age of 83, he announced his retirement. What's wrong with me? I'm old. I'm, I'm getting old and coming apart. Marshall did live to see another Democratic president take office. But only four days after the inauguration, on January 24, 1993, Thurgood Marshall died of congestive heart failure at the age of 85. His coffin was placed in the Great Hall of the Supreme Court building. In a single day, 18,000 people came from across the country to pay a last tribute to the revolutionary Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall has continued to create controversy even after his death. Recently, it was revealed that the FBI was in contact with Marshall about communist activity within the NAACP. He had a great love for the Constitution, and the same way that he resented very much when Southern whites would violate it by denying the right to vote, denying uh, the right where you want to live, denying the right to go to school, and he resented that very much. He, the same way he resented communists who were trying to overthrow the government or at least uh, undo the Constitution. Marshall was inspired by the Constitution throughout his life and his legacy goes beyond his role as the country's first African-American Supreme Court justice. Without Brown in 1954, I can't help but think that things would have been a lot worse than they are. And at least we now have changes that we hardly notice in the sense of black mayors of southern cities. We have a, a black people in Congress. We, we at least have a different way of looking at that problem today, and I think that's in large part due to him. But to those of us who know that struggle is far from over, history has another lesson. It tells us how deeply rooted habits of prejudice are, dominating the minds of men and all our institutions for three centuries, and it cautions us to continue to move forward lest we fall back. I think you have to have an appreciation for the long run, for a life that lasts the whole century, touches every decade of the century, they're good marshals. And you'd have to have appreciation for someone who is willing to stand in there and do battle day after day and achieve social change decade by decade until he had the victory.